Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Chad Kalick, and welcome to the In a Crowded Room podcast for episode number 40, which on this episode, we are going to talk about Kilroy and the black magic of Metamoros. And the story I'm about to tell you is very real, and I actually remembered this story because I received a case submission this morning from Metamoros. What I mean by case submission is I get emailed stuff from all over the world of cases that are going on, even though I'm retired from that kind of work anymore, but I still do read cases. And if I see something that is really super intense, I certainly know people I could forward it on to. But having said that, this case was from Metamoros, Mexico, which reminded me of Mark Kilroy and my own experience in Metamoros which was terrifying to say the least. First and foremost, if you don't know the true story of Mark Kilroy, it goes like this. In 1989, 21-year-old Mark Kilroy was a student at the University of Texas at Austin, where he and his friends decided they were going to make the spring break trip down to Brownsville, Texas, which is a very, very rough city that sits right on the Mexican border. In Brownsville, there is a bridge. A lot of people have nicknamed it the $1 bridge because it costs $1 to walk across the bridge in which you land in Metamoros, Mexico. And Metamoros is set up to take advantage of the spring break population. And uh, they make a lot of money in Metamoros uh, during spring break. Well, Mark Kilroy and several of his friends decided to go there. The beers are super cheap. Uh, It's Mexico in 1989, mind you, which drugs are easy to get. It's just the Wild West, you know. (laughs) It's pretty crazy. So they go over there. They all go out. They get really, really drunk and decide after they get drunk that they are going to the beach, which they do. They all take a dip and decide it's time to go back to America. On their way back to the $1 bridge, Mark Kilroy is lagging behind and gets separated from the group. By the time the group gets to the bridge, they think Mark must be just further back in the line. The bridge is very crowded, by the way. Very, very crowded. So they assume he's just towards the back of the line. His friends cross over into America, and Kilroy never crosses the bridge. Eventually, a missing persons, uh, you know, warning is put out and there's a search for Kilroy in which nobody can find him. It is literally as though Kilroy just vanished. A little over three weeks after Kilroy disappears, a gentleman named Adolfo Constanzo is arrested, in which he is boldly proclaiming that he knows where Kilroy is because he killed him. In fact, he says that he kidnapped Kilroy and took him back to his satanic cult in which they tortured him for several days and then they killed him. Now, I don't want to go into the details of this, guys, because it is pretty much the most horrific thing you will ever read. But if you want to read the details, and I'm giving you fair warning that they are brutal, You can just Google Mark Kilroy and Wikipedia will come up and you could read what occurred. As it turns out, there was a large drug trafficking cult and they believed that by sacrificing human beings, they would have protection from the authorities and they would be able to further their lives and prosper. But they had to consistently suffice their God by these rituals. When all was said and done, the authorities did find the body of Kilroy, plus 60 other individuals, as this had been going on for some time. This man, who led the cult, escaped from a metamoral jail, went to Mexico City, where he was located 
but he was never arrested and he never faced justice because he commanded a member of his cult to shoot and kill him, which that occurred. When all was said and done, what occurred to Kilroy had become legend because of the brutality of his ritualistic killing. Now fast forward to my senior year in college. Spring break rolls around and we have no plans to do anything. And when I say we, I'm referring to my two best friends and roommates, Dusty and Marty. We discussed that college is almost over and we've never been on a spring break together, but we want to do something. At that time, we had a bunch of friends who were going to South Padre Island, which is just a few hours north of Brownsville and Metamoros. We check our bank accounts like most college kids, we're broke as can be, but we figure out that if we all put our money together, worst case scenario, we should have enough gas money to get there, get back, and sleep in a vehicle every night. Sounds great to us. We hop in. Uh, it's actually Dusty's ride. We cruise down there. We meet our friends. But yeah, like I said, we're broke. We have next to no money. What we do have, we're hanging on to like you can't believe. We're practically starving while we're down there. And we hear this story about this bridge that it costs a dollar. And you go on this bridge and you wind up in a town called Metamoros. And over there, everything is incredibly cheap. You can get beers for a quarter, we hear, which at that time I drank like a fish. I mean, I'm a college student, right? Uh, we hear you can get food for next to nothing. You can get, you know, a hotel room so we could all shower for like 10 bucks. We're like, wow, sounds like a deal to us. Let's do it. We meet up with a couple of our friends who are already in South Padre and we say, yo, we're going to Metamoros, Mexico. You want to come? They love the idea. About a group of 10 of us go. We get there. We park in this free parking lot. And right when we get to the front of the bridge, there's a gentleman walking around with these flyers. And he hands me the flyer. And it's the complete detailed story of Mark Kilroy which I find fascinating. At that time, remember, I'm a religious studies student, and I was fascinated with, with the kind of religious aspect of it, even though it was obviously a horrific story. But they're giving us this piece of paper because they're telling us, do not follow anybody anywhere. Do not go off the main strip that is you know, built for spring break, basically, and services spring break. Do not let people talk you into anything. Stay together in a group. Never leave your group. They're basically giving everybody this information, which, again, at that time, this stuff to me sounds exciting. I'm just like, whoa, this is this is crazy. I mean, I've always had that kind of weird, uh, you know, <laughs> excitement for things of this nature, you know, not that I want to get killed or I want to get, you know, uh, you know, mutilated or something by some group, but it just ups the ante, you know, the kind of wild westness of it all. So I'm like, all right, cool. And we hop on the bridge, we pay our dollar. And when we land in Metamoros on the other side, I'm telling you, it was like entering another world. The first thing I see is police officers with freaking machine guns that are loaded, that are just walking around. I mean, just walking around. And I'm not a gun guy, so I couldn't tell you exactly what kind of gun it was beyond machine guns. They looked like uh, the same stuff you see in movies like M16s. It became very real very quickly that this is not a place that you want to get into trouble. Right away, this little girl comes up to me. And she's maybe three years old and she's just adorable. But she's so dirty. You can tell she lives on the street. Her face is dirty. And she has a rose in one hand and chiclets, the gum, chiclets gum in the other hand. And she's holding it up and she's saying, please buy, please buy in English. And I'm like, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I don't, I, I don't want a rose and I, I don't want chiclets gum. I didn't know why they had chiclets gum, but there was chiclets gum fucking everywhere. There was chiclets gum everywhere. But she was like, please buy, please buy. I mean, and she was just adorable, this little thing. And I was thinking the whole time, where's her parents? And I was looking around. I couldn't see her parents. I'm thinking she can't be homeless at three can she i mean there's no way and she's pulling on my hand and i'm like sweetie i'm sorry I, I don't want any gum or flour and she's 
holding onto my hand like she just wants to walk with me. And this thing is just tugging at my heart. And I stop and I lean down and I'm like, sweetheart, no. And she lowers her hand and she starts crying. I mean, real tears are coming down her face. So I say, you know what, sweetie, I'll, I'll take some gum. I'll take some gum, okay? And she holds the gum up and I open my wallet. And at that time, all I had was 220s. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I still got to get home. I still got to eat for three days. I got 40 bucks to my name. God. I can't just look at this girl crying and not help her. So I just gave her a 20. I'm like, here you go. You know, she snatches a dollar out of my hand goes sprinting about 40 yards away where next to this trash can in the shadows, her mom is sitting and she hands her mom the money and she beelines across the street to somebody else she sees and starts pulling the same racket. And I am just like, I'm okay. A learning curve here, Chad. Uh, this is exactly what's going on on this side of the bridge. These are scams that are going on. And... On one hand, I'm upset because I got scammed. But on the other hand, man, you got to respect the hustle. These people are, are trying to eat and trying to live. And, uh, you know, there's an old saying that I believe in, and that's hungry people don't stay hungry for long. You know, so we go walking by her mom, and I stop and I go, You got my money. And she smiles and winks at me. <laughs> I'm like, Okay. So we go to this first bar that we see. It's a wide open bar. And I'm still, you know, my mind is still very much on this Kilroy story. And I go up and, uh, yeah, they've got these Coronas, but they're smaller. They're like, they're smaller beers. Uh, I, I don't know how else to say it, except they're just, they're like tiny. But they do, they cost uh, like a quarter. And I'm like, oh my God. So for the next couple hours, we proceed to just get, hammered I mean completely hammered and while I'm there I go to the bathroom and I come out I go outside just to get some fresh air and have a cigarette and I'm I'm buzzing so hard I'm feeling amazing and I start asking the security guard um, about the Kilroy story and I'm just asking him you know where did where did it happen where was he snatched and you know wh wh you know, where did they find him and and he's telling me like all these details and he finally stops and says, you know, why are you so fascinated with this? And he speaks good English, really good English. And, and most of uh, the Mexicans on that side of the border did speak really good English. And I think they kind of have to, to, to work with the, the U S crowd. And I said, well, I'm just, I'm into religious studies. I'm fascinated with what this cult was and the whole story just seems crazy to me. And he was like, well, you know, uh, be careful, man, because, uh, there's a lot of that going on around here. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of what going on around here? And he was like, a lot of different beliefs. And he goes, and you can find out as much as you want to know. And I remember that, that statement specifically, that you can find out as much as you want to know. And uh, I didn't take it as a warning. I just took it at his, as him telling me that it's rampant, you know. So we talked a little bit more about it. And he was a really cool dude. And I shook his hand and said, thanks for talking to me. And I went back inside, found my group, and there's just, you know, a raging party going on. So we continued for the next three or four hours and decided we're going to go to different bars and keep drinking. And we did. We went to different bars, kept drinking, kept drinking. And the one thing we were also told before we went in there is do not drink the water down here. You will get incredibly sick. Do not drink the water. Which is hard to remember when you're drunk sometimes, you know. But to this point, I've not drunk in any water. I've just drank in their little Coronas or Cervezas, whatever they were, these tiny little beers. And, um, I mean, it's getting to the point where the drunkenness is beyond a buzz. I mean, I am truly hammered to the point where I'm slurring and I'm, you know, having balance issues. And I decide, you know, I need to chill out some. And uh, we leave that bar because we hear that there's this big open air bar. And it's a lot cooler. It's not as hot. Because uh, a lot of these bars were just steaming on the inside. So I'm like, okay, man, let's go there. Let's do it. So we leave. And on the way there, I remember this person yelling, El Gato Negro, El Gato Negro, donkey show, donkey show. And I'm like, what is this? And I walk by and I'm like, El Gato Negro. He's like, yes, the black cat. 
And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, what's a donkey show? I had never heard of a donkey show. I had no idea what a donkey show was. And he's like, oh, come inside and see. You will like very much. And I'm like, uh, what is a donkey show? Uh, well, he explains to me that he's like, it's a woman and a donkey. I'm like, and they do. And he's like, you know, I'm like, oh, get out of here, man. And he's telling me that inside there's this show where this woman is going to have sex with a donkey. And I, I'm like, I'm not interested, dude. Moving on. <laughs> you know. So I move on. I just like leave and. And they're just yelling, you know, El Gato Negro, donkey show, donkey show. And we get all the way down to the very end of this area uh, where that's set up for the spring breakers, basically. Uh, you can tell you don't want to go further than this. And that's where this big open air venue is. And we go inside and it was packed. I mean, there was so many people there. And there were all these girls that are going around serving up shots, serving up shots. And I don't know why, but at the end of the night, we decided that, yeah, let's do some shots. So I did a couple shots, and the next thing I know, it was just like two, two small shots of tequila. And the next thing I know, like, the room is spinning. I'm just looking around the room, and it's literally spinning. I'm having the hardest time, like, keeping, you know, uh, the world still. <laughs> and... I eventually go outside because I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting so sick right now. So actually, I'm pushing through people to get outside because I don't want to throw up on anybody. And I don't want to, you know, uh, vomit on myself. I need to get outside. So I get outside the bar and I'm completely alone at this point. I bailed on all my friends. And I get outside. I come right outside the front door, right outside to the corner of the venue just step over this little ditch and just start throwing up like I've never thrown up. I mean, really bad stuff. And right after you throw up, you know how you kind of feel good for a second? I had thrown up and then right after I felt pretty good and I'm getting ready to cross this ditch to get back up onto the main road. And I hear, give me your hand, my friend. And I look up and it's that security guard. And he's reaching down to help me across. I'm like, oh, cool. I know this dude, you know. So I reach up and grab his hand. He pulls me across. And and he's like, uh, looks like you've had, you know, a little too much tonight. And I'm like, oh, yeah, man. I, I just drank those shots and it just, just knocked the shit out of me. And he's like, yeah, there's more alcohol in that. He's like, you know, real tequila over here is much stronger. and You got to be careful with it. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't ever even drink hard liquor. I'm like, I just drink beer, you know? I'm like, so that was brutal. And, and he's like, where's your friends? And I'm like, oh, man, I think they're inside, you know? And he's like, well, let's go find them and, and get you back with them. And I'm thinking, this dude is so freaking cool, you know? Like, I mean, he's just helped me out. He's giving me info. Really cool dude. So I'm like, okay. So we go back to the door, and they tell us we're at capacity. Can't let anybody in. And I'm like, well, I was just in. I just came out to, to, to throw up. And they're like, well, you're out. I'm like, ah, oh, you're kidding me. I'm like, no, you're out. And he goes, well, that's okay, man. He was like, you know, we can just, uh, you know, wait out here for him. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just got off. No big deal. And I'm like, okay, so you just want to hang out here? And he goes, well, until you get your friends back. And I'm at that drunken state. I'm thinking, well, he's a security guard. So maybe he actually does care about people and, we did have a cool conversation. He was a cool guy. And yeah, so we just ended up hanging out outside uh, the bar. And at some point he said, so did you find out anything more about Kilroy? I said, you know, I, I talked a little bit about it, but no one was interested in talking about it. So I just kind of put it away. And he's like, oh, I understand, you know. And, and we're just kind of uh, walking a little bit around the area. We're not really going anywhere. We're just kind of shuffling, waiting for, you know, my friends to come out. And he goes, well, you know, the, the place where they first held him was right down the street here. I'm like, you're kidding me. And he goes, oh, yeah, you could see it from the street. I go, where? Show me. Show me where. And he's like, oh, it's just right down here, you know. So we start walking. And as we're walking, I get sick again. And I'm like, oh, God, hold on a second. And I throw up again. And I'm like, oh, God. I'm like, I am just so sick, man. I am so sick. And he goes, you got to get water in. You got to get some water in. You're going to get really sick. 
I'm not even thinking about it. And he goes, here. And he hands me a lemonade. There's lemonade with ice in it. And there was a lemonade stand right next to us. So I guess when I was throwing up, he bought this small lemonade or got it somehow. And I didn't even think about it, but water sounded so good at that time after throwing up, having that taste in your mouth or lemonade, whatever. So I just, just guzzled it. And then right after, I was like, oh, dude, wait a minute. I'm like, that's lemonade. That's water, man. Oh, that's going to make me sick as hell. And he goes, ah, don't worry about it. No, it's different. He was like, that lemonade's made with fresh water. You're fine. I'm like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. He goes, I'm sure. I'm like, oh, okay. So we just keep walking, and he's like, yeah, we're almost there. We're still on the main strip. And we keep walking. He's like, yeah, we're almost there still. And we're getting a ways away from the area. And right as I'm about ready to go, dude, what is going on? He says, okay, here it is. It's right down there. And he points down this side alley, and in the shadows, you can barely kind of see this small building. And he goes, it's right there. And I'm like, where? And he goes, there. And I go, I can't, I can't make it out. And he goes, well, come on, we can go up to it. No one's, no one's there. It's an empty, abandoned building now. And I'm like, huh, okay, well, I do want to get a little bit closer. So I start walking down this alley, and I'm not even really, you know, thinking too much of kind of what's going on. And then I get a little bit closer and I could see a little bit more of the building and I finally stop and I go, okay, that's good. And he goes, you want to see inside of it? I know the room they held him too. He goes, I was actually working on the case. I was part of the team that found him. And for whatever reason, that question hit me. This is fucked up. This dude's trying to get me in this room. So I look at him and I'm standing in the middle of this alley, completely off the grid. And I look at him and I go, no, nah, I'm good. And he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And he's just quiet. And he's just staring at me. I'm just staring at him. And I go, dude, I'm going to go back to the strip. And he's like, you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you okay? I go, yeah. And it's quiet. And he's staring at me. And he looks back at me. And he says, you want to know more about this case? And I just took off sprinting as fast as I could back to the street, the main strip. And right before I get to the main strip, the weird thing was I look over my shoulder and he's just standing dead still where he was. He didn't even come after me. He's just standing, staring at me in that alley over my shoulder. I hit the street. I beeline back up to the building where all my friends were at that bar, that massive bar. I can't find them anywhere. I cannot find them anywhere. I'm like, oh my God, I am alone in Metamoros, Mexico. And I, and I start rethinking all my steps. I'm like, I came over here and right away like a dumbass. I'm asking everybody about this Kilroy case and, you know, acting like it, it, it's, you know, I'm so interested in and I want to know. Like, these are the wrong things to do. Okay. This is not something I should have been doing. And it's all kind of hitting me of what my steps were. And I shouldn't have ever trusted this guy. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. And I'm like, this is so freaky, so freaky. So I can't find my guys anywhere. So I'm like walking back, walking back. And all of a sudden I hear, El Gato de Negro, donkey show. And I'm like, oh, geez, this place again. And as I go walking by there, a couple of my friends come walking out of there. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, Dude, I'm like, I have been looking for you guys. And they're like, you do not want to know what we just saw. I'm like, no, I don't. I'm like, well, how did you wind up here? And they said, dude, we followed you out. I'm like, what? And he said, dude, we followed you out. And you jumped across the ditch and threw up. And we were just waiting for you. And then we saw that security guard guy that you were talking to. We saw him pull you across the ditch. And he goes, and we turned around. You guys were gone. I'm like, gone? And he goes, yeah. I go, no, dude, we, we walked around. For at least 10, 15 minutes waiting for you. And they're like, no, that's not what happened, man. They're like, you threw up. We saw him reach out, grab you, kind of give you a hand across the ditch. We were waiting for you to come back to us because we were waiting in the middle of the street. At some point, we all lost sight of you. We turned around and you were gone. And I'm like, no, man. And I filled them in on everything that happened. And they were like, that is just so creepy. 
And I'm like, yeah, let's just get out of here, guys. I go, I just, I want to get out of here so bad, so bad. And they're like, all right, let's do it, man. Let's roll. So we get back to the bridge. And the bridge is just loaded with people. Loaded with people. I'm like, this is going to take forever. And I am so sick right now. Just get me across this bridge. So it must have taken two hours to finally get up to the gates where you go back into America. And when you get up there, they make you take everything off. You got to turn your pockets inside out. If you have a hat, jacket, anything, they search it. And they're looking for drugs. They're looking to see if you're, you know, smuggling stuff back into the U.S. So I'm the last in line. I finally get up and all my friends are in front of me and they're doing like their search and they get to me. And the only thing I had in my pockets was my wallet, which I put out. And then I had a pack of cigarettes. And the pack of cigarettes was smashed because there was like two left. And that was it. So I just forgot that it was in my back pocket. And she says, what is that? And uh, I said, oh, it's a pack of cigarettes. And I pulled it out and I put it on the table. And it was, it was a girl. And, and she said, well, open it. I said, open the pack of cigarettes? And she's like, yeah, show them to me. And what I said under my breath was, Jesus, what do you think? I have a gun in here. And what she said she heard was, wait till I show you my gun in here. So as I say that under my breath, I'm opening the cigarettes up and I just hear all this screaming and people are being shoved out the front. People are being pushed out the back. I mean, I don't know what is going on. Now, remember, I'm very, very drunk at this time, too. And the next thing I know, I feel a barrel to a machine gun underneath my chin. I get pushed to the back wall. I'm turned around, pushed down on my knees. I have to hold my hands above my head. They're basically patting me completely down. Afterwards, they throw me in cuffs, and it's those, like, uh, plastic cuffs the, that just they just cut off the circulation to your arms and they're literally dragging me into a room and I look over my shoulder and I see all my friends who are freaked out because they're like what did he do what is going on they drag me into this completely all white room that has one small window where I could actually see into the American side and all my friends are just waiting across the bridge. And I must have sat in there for a good 30, 40 minutes. And what I kept thinking is, God, guys, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Because I'm on the metamoral side still. These U.S., uh, I don't know, border rangers, whatever they were, they came in and they started going, where's the gun? And I said, guys, I don't have a gun. What are you talking about? And they're like, she said, you said, wait till you see my guy. I go, no, I didn't. I go, I explained the cigarette thing. I said, Jesus, what do you think? I have a gun. And they're like, is this a joke to you? Are we a joke? Is our job a joke? Is drug trafficking a joke? Is murder a joke? Like, I mean, they are laying into me. I'm like, no, no, no. And I am not ashamed to tell you, I started crying. I was like, no, that's not, no, I'm just trying to get back to America. And they're going, do you know, right now, right now we could arrest you and turn you over to the Mexican authorities. You have not made it back to America yet. We can throw you in a Mexican jail right now. And what I'm thinking in my head is they're going to call that guy. They're going to call that guy. And that dude's going to come arrest me and put me in a Mexican jail. And then I'm the next Kilroy. I'm like, I'm, I am freaking out. So I am like literally like begging them. I'm going, guys, I beg you. I'm like, look through all my stuff. I have no drugs, no guns. You know this. I'm like, if I said something stupid, I am sorry. I am drunk. I'm a fool. I'm an idiot. But I'm not somebody that's smuggling drugs or guns or anything like that. I'm like, please just let me go. Please. I go, my friends are waiting out front there and they're like who are your friends who are your friends and it just dawns on me that oh my god did i screw them now did i just point them out as my quote accomplices and then i don't want to say it. it's like who are your friends where are your friends point them out i'm like oh my god 
So they stand me up and they walk me over to the window and I'm like, that's them right there. They're just waiting to take us back to South Padre Island. So they leave and they leave me in here in this cold room, handcuffed like crazy. They come back 20 minutes later. They ask me if they need to perform a cavity search. And I'm like, oh my God, no, I have nothing. I have nothing. I'm just drunk. I have nothing. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I'm just some kid. That said something stupid. That's it. They leave again, in which I make my way back over to the window, and I don't see any of my friends. I am like, oh my God. They arrested them or they left. Either way, this is my worst nightmare. I'm thinking, I am going to Mexican jail right now with the security guard that tried to take me to the holding cell that Kilroy was in. Ugh, it was terrible. I have never been that scared. In my life about 30 minutes after that the female comes in that actually asked me for the cigarette pack and she leans down and she's like this isn't a joke she goes you don't know what we go through every day you don't know what we deal with our life is on the line we are put in danger every single day she's like we're gonna let you go but we don't want to ever see you here again and I'm like okay Please show me the door. I leave. I get across the bridge. All of my friends are waiting in their vehicles. They just got tired of standing, so they went and sat in their vehicles. In which, thank God, we drove all the way back to South Padre Island. Slept in our vehicles that night, which I have never been so happy to sleep in a vehicle in my life because it was better than a Meadow Morals holding cell. And what is my reason for telling you this story? It is because I sincerely believe in the tentacles of evil. My great aunt Rosa used to tell me that when fascination and temptation collide, it creates the devil's finger and it's just waving you towards them. I went down there and immediately I wanted to get close to this Kilroy story. And the universe gave me what I was looking for. And as I was attempting to leave Metamoros, the tentacles of evil reached out, wrapped themselves around me and tried to pull me back. I have never been back to that city. I will never go back to that city. I will never go anywhere near that city. I learned a serious lesson during that trip. And when I woke up the following morning, I knew exactly what that security guard meant when he said to me, you could learn as much about Kilroy as you want. Needless to say, I know more about Mark Kilroy than I ever need to know. Thank you all for listening to episode number 40 of the In a Crowded Room podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with more. All the best.